Twee gasten hier in de kaart vanavond en het zijn allebei Engelsen. Eén daarvan kent vrijwel iedereen. Hij is hier om straks twee stukken van zijn nieuwe cd te zingen. Ik ga ook aan hem praten, een grote tafel. Ik verheug hem er echt geweldig op. Hij is met zijn eigen jet uit Zwitserland speciaal voor ons komen overvliegen. En ik verheug me zo op echt een gesprek voor twee kale mannen van 45. This is the guy, this is the guy I'm trying to find. Hi. Hi. I don't know if you can help me, but do you know this guy? Yes, I can. You do know? Yeah. yeah. Because I've, yeah. I've just landed here and they said I've got to do an interview with him. Yeah. And I don't know where to go. Yeah. And I don't know really anything about it. But do you know where we can get find him? I think so. Yeah? I think in Amsterdam. All right. Well, let's go then. Yeah? Well, do you want to you photograph that face, okay? Uh -huh. Yeah. So you head for that face and I'll follow you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think we've got someone here. We've got someone here that knows, knows who he is and where he is. Good, well let's go. Well we'll be off then. Nice looking man. Still looking for this man. Excuse me. Excuse me. Do you speak English? No. Sorry. Excuse me. I'm not from here. It's a camera, you see. Nobody wants to go near a camera. They're scared stiff. Do you speak English? Well, forget about this. <laughs> now, do you know this man? Yes. You do know this man? Okay, because I've just arrived here from... Uh, from Switzerland, I'm supposed to meet this man for an interview, and I don't know where I'm supposed to go. I, I think it's over there. Is it? Yeah, it's the studio. You do know him, do you? Okay, yeah. great. Don't fight with him. Don't fight with him? No. Why? Is he mean? No, he's not. But... Oh, okay. okay. He's a nice man. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye bye. What well, the hell with him? I'm going with her. <laughs> okay. Straks aan de grote tafel, Phil Collins. Maar... Nou, ik ga het vertellen. Dames en heren, mijn volgende gast. Zijn zesde solo CD net uit. En dat is de. Het is niet meer te tellen hoeveelste CD als je alles meerekent waar hij ooit aan heeft meegewerkt. Mag ik een daverend applaus, een daverend welkom voor een kale man van 45, Phil Collins.
Welcome on the show. Yes, it's nice to be here. Let's talk about... Let's it talk... is nice to be here. It's nice to be sitting at a table. Instead of what? Instead of sitting sort of on a chair somewhere over there while the host has a... Ah, has six a feet away from yeah. you, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is nice. It's like being in your kitchen. Okay. Okay, it's a kitchen table, actually. It yeah. is. Nice it some is. toast, please. <laughs> <laughs> marmalade, too. Marmalade, marmalade. <clears throat> Let's talk applause. You were 14 when you starred in a West End musical, Oliver, uh -huh. as Artful Dodger. Yes, I did that. Consider yourself yeah. at home. Consider Everybody yourself knows. one of the family. <laughs> good God, they know it. So. It's, it's a nice song. I mean, you can sing it when you come out. That's, yes. that's a good thing about the West End production, that, that, the, of the old style anyway. Yes, the 60s musicals were great. I said, let's talk applause. What did it mean to you, playing, being part of a West End production at 14? Well, it was, I mean, to be honest, the Art for Dodger doesn't require much acting ability if you're that way inclined, you know. I mean, I kind of had a great time. I did eight shows a week. And, um, and Saturday night, Friday night and Saturday night, particularly Saturday night in a West End theatre, when it's full and you're in the biggest musical in London. The last ten minutes before the curtain opens. Yeah, fantastic. It was fantastic. Was Why is it so fantastic? I mean, other people could, could imagine it scares scary, the hell yeah. out of you. Well, when I was um, five or six, my mother and father had a boat, you know, we've had boats all, all their lives. And, and uh, I used to belong to a club that we all went to every Thursday and then we used to go and do shows there, you know, dinner and dances. And because the kids were always involved, I was thrown up on a stage at a very early age. So I never thought twice about being in front of an audience, which is why, you know. Okay, so it didn't scare you? No. But what was, what was it that made it so beautiful for you? Was it the applause? I don't think it was the applause because I don't, you know, you have to do that, you know, I, I used to enjoy it even on a Wednesday matinee when there's like 50 old age pensioners in there, you know. That's when you really know whether you want to do this for a living or not. <laughs> That's when you really find That's out. That's when you figured out, I'm going to be a drummer. Let's, let me ask you something about drummers. We used to have a very famous agent in Holland and in the 60s he used to, uh, to fly in American jazz bands, big bands, mm -hmm. and he used to say, when I hire a 40-piece big band, 40 guys, plane lands on Schiphol Airport, taxis out, comes to a standstill on the apron, door opens, one guy falls out of the plane. That's the drummer. That's the drummer. <laughs> Why is that? I don't know. They always say that the drummer is the fat, bald, ugly guy at the back of the band, you know. <laughs> and of course, I've got to agree with him. Um, <laughs> uh, but now I'm, not a, now I'm not a drummer, just a drummer anymore, you see, so I can make drummer jokes. It's okay. Is that the difference? You can't make a drummer joke when you're a drummer? No, I think um, they've, always, they've always been the brunt of the abuse in the group. 
But I think for me, the drummer is, for me, a, a band is as good as its drummer. You know, you can have a lousy band with why, a great drummer. Why is that? Well, it's just, I think that if it all stems from rhythm and, and groove. If, if something is, is really has a groove to it, then, I mean, I say groove as opposed to groove, you know. If it has, I mean, if it has a, a, a groove that you can't, that makes your body want to move, and then, then that's, that can, an average to bad song can exist with a great groove. Whereas if you've got a great song, but it doesn't move you at all, then, then that usually means the drummer's not up to it. And that's what I'm just saying, is that the band is as good as its drummer, in the same way that a football team is the same, as good as its goalkeeper. Maybe it's because, well, that's an interesting comparison, maybe it's because <coughs> they, they're both the only ones that can overview the chaos in front of them. That's true, yeah. I mean, when, and when it comes down to it, it's like you, you're, you're the one that has to sort of keep playing if the power goes off, you know? It's so like the, le happen. the left hand of the piano player. I mean, if you have to cut yeah. off one hand of the piano player, yeah, cut, his, cut his right hand off. Well, some piano players, you can cut both hands. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Nuke them. Listen. Um, if uh, talking, t uh, talking with you about your work, it means talking about yourself because I understand everything you've ever written is, is uh, taken from your own private life, which, uh, which puzzled me when, when listening to... Uh, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I didn't I do it. I didn't it. No, no, no. <laughs> but I, uh, of course, every, well, a lot of people know the story about Face Value, one of the older albums, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, which is um, filled with songs that you written after your wife had left you and you were you separated and you got miserable and depressed and whatever. I, I, I got puzzled by that because I can understand anybody writing about stuff like that, mm -hmm. but stand in front of 20,000 people in an audience and sing about how your wife left you seems like a painful experience. Well, I mean, by the time you, by the time you are standing in front of 20,000 people singing it, I guess you got used to it. You've got used to the fact that this is, you know, public knowledge, if you want, or public domain. I mean, I started, you see, I never, I never started out to make a, a solo record. What I did was, when that, that thing happened to me, I suddenly found myself with loads of time on my hands because Tony and Mike in Genesis were doing their solo albums to give me the time to sort myself out. And uh, so I had all this time and some new equipment that I was trying to learn how to operate, and I was, you know, miserable, upset. Sometimes I was very happy. Sometimes I was very drunk. You know. But you are writing songs about misery. Didn't you think, well, my, not my God, what am I going to do when I have to sing this? But I didn't think that, you see, because I just wrote these songs. I, didn't, I wasn't making a record. I just wrote these songs and happened to be recording them because I was trying to see if I could actually do that, actually physically get that music onto tape. And then I remember playing it to my manager, Tony Smith, and he, you know, he said, these are great songs, you know, we should do, you should do something with them. It's an album. And I said, well, I can't face recording them again because these are you know, these are spontaneous things from my heart. And, um, and so we basically put out my demos with some overdubs on top of them. So I didn't really set out to make a record, you know. And, but then uh, there was this moment. I mean, they said, ah, you've got to do a tour now. Right. Uh, well, it was actually t two records later before I did my first tour. And by that point, you know, I mean, it's, it's a thin line. When you go and play these songs, when I play In the Air Tonight, for example, which was, a, I guess, an angry, bitter song written about that time, I don't think about what it was written about at the time, which I don't really know what it was about anyway, but I mean, I, I don't think about that way, I, that feeling that I had at the time. You just sing it because it's a song. If you're it's singing, a separate thing now. Yes. Does that go for it the... It has its own life. Does it work that way the other way around? Because you, 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 you wrote a beautiful song to your son, father to son. Mm -hmm. uh, a father speaks to his adolescent song. I mean, he's, he's teaching, teaching him stuff that he wants to know. I mean, yeah. getting to know the girls and what can happen. That's right his insecurities and stuff like that. How does he react when you, when you stand in front of an audience and sing about him? Oh. Because that's his life you're talking about. That's right. Well, that particular song was, was because I don't live with my, my children. You know? um, so that was like, I may not be there for you when you want to ask me this question. So listen to this. You know, this is my little book, Pocket Guide to Life, if you like. Did he um, ever respond to that uh, song? Did uh, he ever tell you, Dad, I'm embarrassed, or I, I, oh, I knows, love you for it, or I oh, thank no, you for it, or what? He, I think he loved the fact that I wrote the song for him, and just the fact that I've made a video for it, which includes bits of him and me and my dad. I mean, uh, he doesn't have a problem with that. I think now, he's 20 years old, and now he has his own band, and he's working, th he's got three or four groups going, like I used to have, and now he sees why I did things, you know, why you can't stop yourself from doing things, why you love it so much that you work so hard. 
Now he's saying the same thing, so he understands it. He's a drummer or a singer? He's a drummer and a singer. <laughs> and a keyboard player. He's, he's, he's either got balls or he's insane. I mean... No, I mean, he, and he looks like me, poor guy, too. No, he's, he's a very talented guy. Very talented Your son guy. looks like me? <laughs> he looks like me. That's right. You or me doesn't really matter. Does it? <laughs> what about this? Well, you, you just said that there's a, uh, this beautiful clip that you made about this song, right? Yeah. Father to Son. Uh, it, there's little bits of you and your dad in it. Well, that, that's that's a, a, a mm. melancholy sort of mood that you were trying to get me in in that clip. Yeah, well... We'll show it. Yes. Okay. Sometimes you admit it you. You're the only one. There's all the things you thought were safe. Ooh, now they're gone. But you won't be alone. I'll be here to carry you along Watching you till all the work is done what, is, what does it mean? Well, there's, um, there's a piece in it where was because I, re I realized, uh, and I suppose some people, as they get to a certain age, they start to realize that they are like their mother or they are like their father. And... Um, and I see a piece of in this film, which uh, which I so accumulated all the family footage, you know. And when I was looking at it, I was kind of um, I saw me as a about, you know this this high with my dad, and we're standing at the water's edge on the Thames. We're just standing right on the edge of the water, and the camera's behind us, and we're not holding hands enough. We just stand there, and then suddenly my dad turns and walks away, and walks up the stairs. Which is a funny way to do because you could fall into the exactly, dance. and he just left me there, <laughs> and and I. And I just sort of realise that he's gone, and then I turn around and I follow him. And, and he's gone by this point, I'm clambering up the stairs like this. And I realise that, that that's, there's a lot of me in that, you know. I find myself walking two steps in front of people I'm actually going out with, you know, going out on a visit with or something. Um, and suddenly you find yourself, God, I'm becoming like, I'm becoming like my dad, oh no! You know, which isn't a bad thing, but it's just that you, you, there are certain things that hit you hard. But you have to live through them yourself, I suppose. He died when you were 21? Yeah. Were you, were you successful by then? No, I wasn't. I mean, Genesis had just come back from our first American trip, which, in which we played New York, played very badly, gone down very well, but we thought, okay, that's America, right, now we're next. You know, not realizing that if they heard of you in New York, they'd never heard of you outside, you know, the 50 yard or 50 mile radius maybe. So, um, so I came back and, uh, and he died that Christmas. So he never, he, he was never very happy about me doing music. I mean, uh, going from Oliver, which was a very respectable West End, West End production, you know, where he could say in, when he went to the office, what's, your, what's Philip doing? Oh, he's on the West End stage, you know. You know, and it would be very proud of me. I said, what's your Philip doing? Well, he's actually raping and pillaging his way around the world in a rock and roll group. Doesn't sound very good, you know what I mean? <laughs> Tell me about it. There's what? an old interview of you saying, I still worry, w worry more about the people that don't buy my oh, yeah, CDs yeah. than the ones that do. Why? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to wean myself off it, you know. I try to, I try to wean myself off reading all the reviews, of gloating over... I don't gloat over the good ones. I get bothered by the bad ones. I try to forget about it. I'm trying my best, you know. I'm moving on. But it's very hard, you know. When, some, when something's written, you can't sort of not read it. You've got to read it. Um, so consequently, I read all this stuff, and you know, occasionally I've put pen to paper and written to journalists or reviewers of concerts. Hold on, you actually write letters to critics? To, to critics? Yeah, I have you done. still do that? I haven't done it for for a while. Yeah, but I, I did on, on the. Uh, I guess it was the Serious tour, which was 1990. I, it was in San Francisco. There was a very very bitchy review from someone, and I referred to this bitchiness in my letter. But, um, but he was, you know, he called me the McDonald's of music, you know, and, and it's just, and, and it was kind of, people are very suspicious of success. That's what I find interesting. I mean, they, I mean journalists and, and, and the media are. If you're successful, they assume that you've lowered your common denominator to take in everybody, you know. But in fact, all that's happened is that you happen to have tapped in by coincidence or by luck to what people want to hear at that particular time. You know, and you're you're in the business. But I'm for not worried about it now, you're, Listen, you're in the business for thirty years now. <laughs> why, 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 of all people, do you still write letters or pick up the phone and call them? Lots of other people would have 
folded up the newspaper, threw it away. And they'd have been happy. Use it for toilet paper. <laughs> Why do you bother? I don't know. I wish I didn't. And I'm trying my best not to. But I keep talking about it. <laughs> no, I really, I'm, I'm trying my best. I, I've come to realise that the man in the streets, the real person, like you, like me, the real person, you know, they either like it or they don't like it. But, you know, if you can, you do, and if you can't, you criticise. You know. So what's I just... Mo what's more important to you, the applause of your audience of the, or the applause of your colleagues, your fellow musicians? Well, I, in the early days of playing the drums, I always wanted to be respected by other musicians. That was the most important thing to me. You know, and, uh, and that is kind of still... The case. St still the case, I think. If you had to choose between one and the other as to what was more important, yeah. So you want the applause of your fellow musicians, the applause of the critics, and a lot of people to <laughs> buy the CD. You're setting your goals rather high, aren't you? I'm just trying to get it... I mean, it's, I think it's a, actually a, a very... It's an admirable trait to never be satisfied, to be honest. I'd much rather never be satisfied and just keep going and just trying to get it right each time, or righter each time, than just sit back and say, well, I sold millions of records, got millions of pounds, I mean, why should I worry about it? Well, you know, I do. Do you have to be civil to those people? Do you, don't, you, don't you ever get a, a feeling of hitting on the guy? I mean, so wait, they write stuff about you that is really hideous, that has got nothing to do with your music at all. They write about your face, the way you look. Mm -hmm. You feel like going meet some guys like that? No, not really. I mean, um, makes you a bit angry. You know, they didn't talk about the music, they talk about what you look like. But, um, no, I don't... Uh, I've, I've, I've very rarely come into contact with anybody. I, I, I ran after a paparazzi a photographer once. Um, in New York, because he was jostling my kids and my and my wife, and I'd already given them, we'd already posed for pictures before the party. It was the end of tour party, and I came out. I had a couple of drinks, I guess, you know, like as you do at the end of a tour party. And, and this guy was still there, still causing problems. And so, I, you know, there's pictures of me being, sort of, you know, physically held back. And I ran down the street after him, and uh, I, you know, he ran away faster than I did. And this is the guy that actually successfully sued Ryan O'Neill for for two million dollars or something, because Ryan O'Neill did catch up with him and did hit him. Ah, you know? so be glad he was yeah. a faster runner than you were. Right, exactly. <laughs> so anyway, so I but was... But that um, doesn't go with the image of Mr. Nice Guy all well, the time. I never no. said I was nice. I didn't say either, but that's what people make of you, I so that's why I wonder, why do... Do you ever get aggress aggressive with people? Of course people? you do. Of course you do! Um, <laughs> no, of course you do. I mean, everybody has their, you know, their, their, their limit past which they crack. You know, some people have a very low threshold and some people have a high threshold. I personally believe people are innocent until proved guilty. So I'm always trying to find out, I'm always trying to give people the benefit of the doubt as to why they did this, why they said that, why would this person do that. But then after, at that point, then, then I, I lose my temper and I, I crack the same as anybody else would. Your weak spot used to be the way you look. Are you still insecure of that? Or are you finally at I, 45, I, you figured out you're not going to look any better than <laughs> we're, we are not, we're not going to look any better than we do today, so... Yeah. It's downhill from now on. Um, uh, <laughs> I never, I never actually, um, I was never really worried about it. I, what it bothers me is the fact that, you know, you have a record out and they, for the first, well, for two-thirds of the review, they will talk about what you look like. That I find, I find frustrating. But I've, um, I've never really bothered about, you know, this, my hairline has been like this since I was, you know, very young. And uh, my dad was the same. I mean, it's just, it's just the way it is. Um, in fact, I, if anything, I look, I'm physically in better shape now than I, I've ever have been. So in that respect, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not worried. I mean, it's just, this is what I am, you know. You're going to carry on doing what you're doing? Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know what to do. I haven't got anything else I can do. What do you want to achieve? I mean, can't well, be that, the, it's not the applause, it's not the money. It, I, it's my life, it's my hobby, it's my job, it's everything. So it's going to be Phil Collins forever? I'm afraid so. <laughs> Thanks for being on the show. Thank you very much. Phil Garland! <laughs> I'm Janine, and welcome to you, Phil Collins. It's in your eyes. It's in your eyes 
Kijk kijken graag tot volgende week zaterdag. We zijn er weer hier aan het Rembrandtplein in Amsterdam. Goedenavond.